This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. Hello, welcome to the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. My name is Travis Manson. Hope you guys are having a great week. We got another awesome guest talking with the top smallmouth anglers across the country and learning so, so much along the way. You know, we've talked with local and regional anglers that just dominate a specific body of water. We talked with touring pros that are on some of the biggest bass fishing circuits out there. And today's guest, Brandon Polnick, doesn't really need an introduction if you've hung around the fishing world. You know who Brandon is. He's going to bring it to you when it comes to big smallmouth bass. I'm really, really excited to be able to chat with Brandon tonight. But before we do that, we got to talk about the real shot. They carry all the most wanted bass tackle baits that a smallmouth crush fan could ask for. Top brands like Mega Bass, Jackal, Evergreen, Z-Man, Daiwa, Shimano, Dirty Jigs, Omega, Kitex, St. Croix Rods. You name it, they got it. They got the staple brands too. Rapala's, VMC, Berkeley. Their website makes shopping super, super easy. Same day shipping, by the way. They'll get that out to you before your big bass adventure or your big tournament. They got a lot of different baits there. Every time you shop, it helps out. Helps out this podcast. And if you use Smallmouth Crush 15, we're going to give you 15% off your first order. So head on over to therealshot.com. Let them know Smallmouth Crush sent you. And stock up on some of that tackle. Thank you. Without further ado, let's bring him on. He just pops up here in the screen. Brandon, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good, man. Doing good. Awesome. Man, excited to talk to you. You definitely belong in that category i mean you dominate everywhere you go you know that you don't even need an introduction but i do want to kind of set the stage here and let some of the listeners and viewers that may have not have heard about you a little bit about your background living in idaho right now but traveling all over the country so i'd love to hear that story my love for smallmouth fishing came from the fact that i live in idaho that's where uh, all of that started. Uh, we've got some phenomenal smallmouth fisheries. And what's funny is after fishing on tour for the last 10 years, most people think that that's all we have in Idaho is smallmouth. But realistically, when I was growing up, pretty much all of our tournaments were dominated by largemouth and even still Today, a lot of our smaller bodies of water only have largemouth in them. They don't even have smallmouth. But I realized early on when I was fishing local tournaments that the smallmouth really weren't getting messed with. They were, you know, pretty untouched. And we actually had a kokanee die off. And for those that don't know what a kokanee is, it's pretty much a landlocked sockeye salmon. So they do the same thing. They swim around, they're silver and blue like they would in the ocean. And then when they go to spawn, they turn bright, bright red with green heads and everything. So it looks just like a sockeye salmon pretty much. And the the cool thing is, is that when those kokanee are in that three, four, five inch size, our smallmouth population just takes off and absolutely booms. And happened to be around here fishing local tournaments when that happened uh, most recently and it was like every all the small mouth went from two and three pounders to three and four pounders and then four and five pounders and then guys were catching mm -hmm. sixes and seven and seven and a half and uh you know and there were even a couple eight pounders caught and being like being in the midst of all that happening i was able to learn a lot about small mouth behavior uh, you know, kind of adapt to their nomadic ways and actually appreciate 
the the things the characteristics that make them different right the the way that they are wired different from a largemouth uh and and then i've just been able to take that you know all around the country and be able to apply that to the smallmouth fisheries that we go to mm. well it sounds like you have an amazing amazing fishery up there i i'm looking at a map a united states map here and i see idaho it's a big state where in reference uh, would you call home so I'm right up there near Coeur d'Alene. So I'm about two hours south of Canada. You see oh, Spokane, Washington. Way up I'm there. pretty much San Spokane, Washington, and uh, and Montana. The smallmouth in that region. I I'd really love to know the answer to this because it fascinates me. You know, different regions. The fish sometimes act a little bit different. You know, of course, you have your southern smallmouth. You have the Great Lakes. You have inland smallmouth. Is there a difference or? or more of a similarity? I would say a smallmouth by design is similar across the entire United States, right? They have, they have little idiosyncrasies that make them a smallmouth. Uh, you know, they're slightly more aggressive. Mm. They hunt in wolf packs a lot more than largemouth do. I mean, largemouth will do that in certain clear bodies of water, but smallmouth are notorious for that. Um, uh, I, I would say the biggest difference is uh, available cover and bait fish. Those are two things that will change the way smallmouth react. And even though they're not a super strict cover oriented species, uh, really the two things that make a difference is a bunch of grass, a place like St. Clair, where you don't have a lot of contour lines, but it's got a bunch of grass everywhere and versus a place that has just a bunch of rock or is steep and those fish will live slightly different and then based on the primary forage right you got places like the great lakes that have all the gobies those fish live different i mean even the great lakes themselves those smallmouth have adapted over time to the gobies I mean, they didn't used to live the same way that they do now. Um, and you see right. that, you know, places like Lake Oahe in South Dakota. When we went there, that was the first time I'd ever been to a smallmouth fishery, actually any fishery, where there really wasn't anything that lived on the bottom. No crawfish. It's the only lake I know of in the United States that actually does not have crawfish. Sure. Um, and then they didn't have gobies. And so the only thing they fed on was like owl wives and ciscos and smell and these things that, you know, would just live nomadically up high in the water column. And you saw the smallmouth adjust to that. You know, very rarely did I actually catch one off the bottom. They're wired the same, no matter where you go across the country, but they adapt to their surroundings to their environment that they live in. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. At least my next question, you know, when you're preparing for whether it be a, a tournament or you're just going out fun fishing for smallmouth, you mentioned, um, you know, fishing North Dakota, right? Is that where it was located or South Dakota? Uh, South, that one's in South Dakota. South Dakota. Preparing for that, what goes into the research and, and just getting ready to go there? Were you, I'm assuming you were aware of the forage and so you kind of maybe went at that lake a little bit different than you would some other lakes you're familiar with or walk me through that. Cause that, yeah, that was probably one of the more difficult ones to research because it wasn't a body of water that we had ever been to before on the elite series. There's not that many bass tournaments at all in South Dakota, let alone on Oahe. Uh, you know, you really, you see more of the bass tournaments on the east side of South Dakota, closer to Minnesota and things like that. And so it's, when you're doing that online research, really the only things that you can gather are, you know, some guide reports that are on there, but that's pretty vague. And, uh, and then bait fish, right? Like trying to figure out how the body of water lays out, looking at, topo maps and lake master charts and seeing kind of you know where the big flats are and where the bluff walls are and then kind of taking the knowledge that you do have and applying that to how it sets up with the bait fish and the available cover 
knowing that those two things are going to change how those small knot live. And then for me, it was all about, you know, finding kind of these big offshore flats, essentially that these smallmouth could relate to that would be close to the river channel that would allow the bait fish to move in and out and still give those smallmouth some sort of an edge. You know, I always look for some type of an edge or an ambush place when I'm smallmouth fishing. And even though they didn't relate to the bottom, they would relate to that drop or that, you know, that river channel swing. And it may be in 60 foot of water and they may only be 30 foot down, but they were still relating to that drop. What would be one of your favorite places to fish for smallmouth across the country? If you could pick a, mm. a body of water. I would say the Eastern basin of Lake Ontario, St. Lawrence river has got to be one of my favorites. Uh, mm. I, I love the clear water. I love the diversity of it. Uh, um, you know, the fact that on the same day you can go catch them in 50 foot of water and you can also go catch them up in five foot of water. There's not a lot of places that you can do that. You know, even though it's one of the great lakes, the thing that's really cool with the great lakes is they all fish different. You know, even though they have the same forage base, things like water clarity and um you know those different you know the way that the bottom contours are laid out those all change you know even you look at lake erie the east side of erie fish is completely different than the west side of erie yeah you, you're drop shotting both of them a lot of times but the places that those fish live and the depths in which they live oftentimes are very different um, and i think that's why i like the saint lawrence river so much is that you have access to the river and access to that eastern basin of the lake and those fish just live differently and so it gives you those options and from a tournament perspective it generally fish is really big you know you can cover a lot of water and get away from guys which i like to do mm -hmm. uh, and so that for me that's got to be one of the best places there is in this country very cool i cannot argue that it is um it's a beautiful, beautiful area to fish. And of course the fishing's fishing's awesome out there. You've had a lot of success. Uh, you've won some big events out there. You've taken some very long runs, some gambles, and it, it's paid off for you. You know, looking back on, on different bodies of water, like, like Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence river, when you go back to these places to fish, do you try to, to fish history? You know, now that you've spent a lot of time there, are you looking for new things and if you could help the listeners and viewers out, you know, if you're going to a body of water and you, you've had some experience on there, you want to start thinking outside the box, wh what direction do you go uh, to try to try to find something new on these bodies of water? The biggest thing is to pay attention to what is holding those fish there, right? If you have an area of the lake that is consistently good over time, you have to pay attention to what is actually making that place good. Right. And then build off of that. And the easiest thing to start with is spawning habitat. You know that those smallmouth have to have spawning habitat. And if you can have that and have and essentially draw a straight line from the spawning habitat to deep water where those fish can summer and winter, you're going to be able to find those fish somewhere in between. And a lot of the places I fish are based off of that, right? Of places I can look at the map and say, okay, here's where they can spawn. Here's where they can spend their summer, their winter, their fall, whatever they want to do. And then I'm going to find them either on either end of that or somewhere in between, just depending on how, you know, how it sets up that week. Generally smallmouth for the most part are Northern, more Northern states. And so the one thing you got to think about is everything happens so much faster. Uh, and so even things like a longer winter or a colder winter, you know, more ice on a body of water can delay that spawn. And then that delays how quick they move out to deep water. And so just because you have a tournament every week, July, you know, the third week of July somewhere doesn't mean that you can go to the same places and catch them every single time. I mean, we fish in, you know, the end of July, first part of August at the St. Lawrence river, 
uh, like we've been there, I think six years or something. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it's ever been the same. I catch them in the same area as often, but it's not like I can say, Oh, I'm going to go roll up to this rock and I'm going to catch them off this rock or I'm going to catch them on this drift. You know, you may be on the same shoal, but that drift may be 40 yards to the left or 40 yards to the right or up or, you know, on the face of it, just because there may be different amounts of current. Um, you know, there's just, they live in the same areas, but you have to dial it in to exactly where they're at. I think that was really good advice, you know, as far as locating areas to fish. Basically, you know, Brandon, you, you mentioned just looking at a flat, looking at areas where they would possibly be spawning that and drawing a straight line out to deep water. I mean, that's uh, as simple as that sounds. I think hearing it, what you just said is really going to help people uh, really tune that in because um, it makes perfect sense. It's obvious, right? But until you, you yeah. get so overwhelmed sometimes with these bodies of water, you know, the, oh, there's this over here and you look at a map and you see an underwater point and this area looks good. But you really just made things really, really simple. Now, I know your brain doesn't – maybe – I don't want to speak for yourself, but, I mean, are you – do you go in these events, like, really, like, with a simple approach? How would you describe that, that mindset? I try to keep it really simple because I feel like majority of the fish live a very simple life, and us as humans just complicate in in what we do and how we approach it uh and it, it really is that simple right and it's kind of based off of a theory that i use that i adopted from a guy back here at home that used to have a tv show and he fished for everything all kinds of species and he was, he was one of the best anglers that i knew as far as just catching fish uh, and he was a phenomenal bass fisherman and he called it the percentage triangle theory and he kind of developed it over time of consistently catching these big fish. And then I took that and just applied that kind of across the country and adapted it to my style of fishing. And it really, I mean, the base of the triangle is the spawning area. That's one thing that we know is going to happen every single, you know, at least once a year, some mm -hmm. places, maybe twice a year. Uh, and you use that as your base. And you've got a pretty good idea that in the summertime, most places that are going to work their way out toward deep water, you know, they don't have to be in deep water, but they're going to be and have close access to deep water. And you just, you draw a line from one to the other. And for me, when I, when I lay a map out and I can look kind of dissecting a body of water, it allows you to break it down and say, I'm going to go spend my time in this area, you know, rather than look, trying to say, Oh, this point looks good. And then this point over here looks good. And that point looks good. And this hump and this Creek channel swing. And because when you do that, you end up just running from spot to spot to spot. And you're not really dialing in why the fish are there. And, and so being able to figure out kind of what stage they're at, then that allows you to, expand from those areas that you're familiar with you know if it's on your home lake and you fish the same area all the time and you want to expand from that that's the first thing you need to do is be able to identify those things and find similar areas very good advice you know i i wanted to ask what your strengths are when it comes to smallmouth fishing but i mean i think what you just said you know, is it is it finding fish is it you know, using that formula, I mean, what would you say your greatest strength is when it comes to smallmouth fish? I, for me, it's probably finding that just a slightly larger than average size of fish, right? And okay. it's not always the largest popula population of fish or the largest group of fish, but being able to find those groups of three or four, you know, smallmouth that instead of three and a half and four pounders, they're four and a half and five pounders. Mm. And a lot of times when you look at smallmouth events, it's not that kicker fish, you know, like you go to Florida and a guy's got 18 pounds, but he's got a nine pounder in there. And then he's mm -hmm. got four fish for nine pounds, yep. smallmouth fishing, like to win in an event or be consistent is the best way to do that is, to make sure that your smallest fish is a four pounder, right? And then 
you know, when your smallest fish is a four and a half pounder, your big one might only be a five pounder. Mm -hmm. But when you do that, those little, you know, quarter and half pound increments are really what separate you from, you know, maybe just barely cutting a check to making a top 10. Wow. Good advice. What would you consider your favorite way to, to smallmouth fish as far as uh, technique wise? I love sight fishing them Do you? and not, not spawning fish, but I love sight fishing them when they're cruising those shallow flats, uh, you know, and they're just kind of getting up there covering water and they're wolf packed up. Cause those fish are usually aggressive. They're there to do one thing and that's eat. And I love doing that. Um, you know, I probably have had more success offshore staring at my electronics, dropping on them, which I love doing as well. But there's mm -hmm. just something cool about like sliding up and seeing that big black missile sitting on a sand flat sure. and yep. casting out there and just watching them swim over and eat it. I mean, that's to me, it's just, it doesn't get any better than that. No, it, it's something that I think if, if anyone's, getting into smallmouth fishing or you've done it for a while and you haven't experienced the thrill of actually going out and, uh, you know, seeing these fish before you catch them looking for these cruising fish. It's almost like, like hunting where you, you know, you might be trophy mm -hmm. hunting for a big eight, 10 pointer. Well, you're looking for that big five plus pound smallmouth, just chilling up shallow. And that's probably why you love the Eastern basin of Ontario and, and the St. Lawrence river. I mean, it's relatively crystal clear most of the for times sure. of the year. Man, it, it gets me excited because yep. that's actually my favorite technique as well. So I want to I want you to walk us through how you would approach that. You know, there's a lot of shallow flats. You pull out a map of any of these big bodies of water like Lake Ontario, like the St. Lawrence River, and there is shallow flats all over the place. So I want to find out, you know, how you approach that, and then we'll kind of get into some techniques that you use as well. One thing that I've always talked about ever since I first started talking about smallmouth, if you can – and this applies to any depth does not matter what depth, but if you can find sand, rock and grass combined, like those three things in conjunction with each other, and there's an edge there, there will be smallmouth. doesn't matter if it's in 50 foot or if it's in five foot or less, like you find those things in that combination, or at least two of those things. And you're going to have a small mouth around, uh, they, they like that edge because they like to cruise those edges. And so I look for those places that uh, allow me to do that, right? Where I don't have to just zigzag all over this big flat, you know, and sometimes it can even just be a sand drop, but hmm. it has to be a very steep and abrupt drop. You know, they would like, it has to have that edge. Um, and if you've got a little bit of, grass or a little bit of rock mixed in with that sand it's even better that's just that's something that i look for whether it's you know staring at my hummingbirds out deep or staring you know through my lenses looking up shallow and i mean that's just it it seems to work anywhere across the country if you can find those three things in conjunction can you describe ideal conditions for that pattern like if you could pick a, a, the perfect day to be able to implement that pattern, what are the conditions that you're facing? Hot and sunny. And I, I mean, flat, like dead flat calm is the best because you can see them the furthest. Mm -hmm. I say it's the best. It's the best to be able to see them. So like in practice, I love when it's flat calm because you can see them from a long ways away and cover a bunch of water. And you can see deeper, you know, a lot of these fish, like what we consider shallow fish in these places that have 25, 30 foot of visibility, it looks like they're in three foot of water, but they're actually in like eight or nine foot of water. Mm. And, it, and so when you have that, you know, just slick calm conditions, it helps see, especially if you're on a place like St. Lawrence river, where you've got current, that's going to distort the water as well. But actually, if you if you have a little bit of ripple on the water, they will bite better, you know, versus just following your stuff. And if you're on a place that they're not pressured, it doesn't matter as much. But if you're on a body of water that they're pressured, they get beat up shallow a little bit. Man, that's some good some good tips. Now, when you're when you're practicing for an event looking for fish shallow, 
I assume you're just covering water and you're probably not even making casts. But let's say you were out there just fun fishing. What's your, you know, rods that you're going to have on deck when you're trying to locate those fish up shallow and actually sight fish? If I'm actually trying to catch them, I'm going to have a drop shot, you know, probably an X zone finesse slammer on there. And, and then I'm going to have a uh, Stormarashi sp- spy bait on there. Mm-hmm. And then probably going to have a black hair jig and a jerk bait between those things. You know, those four, you can go anywhere and catch them. Um, you know, in one day, one might be better than the other. You know, sometimes they want something suspended up in the water column and some days they want to just eat off off the bottom. Um, I'm not much of a Ned rig guy, but a Ned rig is also deadly in those situations. Sometimes when you get up shallow and you don't have ideal conditions, so I'm talking perhaps it's cloudy. uh, You got a little bit of wind. It's just not, it's visibility is not that good. Are you still going to try to throw some type of reaction bait or maybe you are still slowing it down or are you bailing on that plan totally and, and maybe going deeper and looking at your electronics? It really depends on the fishery. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times it gets cloudy like that. The deep bite is actually better and those fish just don't position and pull up. There'll still be a few shallow here and there, but it seems like, the hotter and the sunnier it is, the better that shallow bite is. Right. And it's, I mean, but then when you get to a place that has maybe like isolated grass patches and things like that, then you can get away with throwing a jerk bait or, um, you know, burning a spinner bait across, you know, the tops of those things and stuff, and you can catch them really well. And the other thing I would say is that in, in the fall, if the, if you have a place where those small mouth, start to move back shallow in the fall, then you can really crush them on those cloudy days because they're, they're there to eat. The water temperatures are dropping. And if you've got perch that are up shallow position around grass and sand flats and stuff, they're there to eat and they're just going to continue to eat. They're not going to disappear from those places just because of the cloud cover. Right. Do you have that opportunity in, in Idaho when you're out fishing to get up shallow and look for smallmouth? Is there is there that type of pattern on those bodies of water out west? We get it a little bit, uh, but it's not something that, you know, really carries on throughout the year. Like you see in a lot more of like kind of the northeast part of the mm-hmm. country. Um, there are a few places we can do it. You know, some of the lakes are better than others, but it seems like because we are a lot of our fish are so keyed in on trout and kokanee that they'll actually they'll go deep and they'll start mm-hmm. chasing those and position to you know ambush that type of bait fish now if we there'll be certain times in the year where the little baby perch are you know the perch spawn and then you've got all these little schools of tiny baby per- perch and if they get around the grass, you can get up and you can see them shallow on the calm days. Well, let's talk a little bit about deep fishing. You mentioned uh, that's another pattern or technique that you love to to use your graphs. You go out there. When you're looking at new bodies of water or a new area to fish and you're, you're, you're doing your due diligence, right? You're sitting behind the steering wheel and you're just mm-hmm. you're graphing. Uh, walk me through a, a, a typical day when you're out deep. What are you looking for? You just mark in a bunch of spots marking fish walk me through that whole process for me it's a lot like i just had talked about you know finding that uh, mixture of rock sand and grass and really rock and sand is the main thing but if you can find any type of grass mixed in with that it just seems to hold the bait better and seems to hold more small mouth and so i spent a lot of time you know looking at the side imaging you know, idling the contours that I identify first. So I'll pull up the Lake Master charts either on my phone, the computer, or actually on the, the units themselves. And and then identify those places I want to look at. And then I just kind of zigzag and side image across these things, either 
looking for, you know, rock veins, a grass edge, or sometimes it's isolated boulders. Uh, it just kind of sure. depends on the time of year and the way that those fish want to position. And I would say, you know, smallmouth a lot of times can be harder to actually mark on on your electronics. Um, if they're real deep, you can mark them. But what happens a lot of times is I think they, in those real clear bodies of water, they'll see the boat movement and they'll see the shadow and they, they'll just slide outside the cone and then they come right back. And mm-hmm. so you'll n- never even pick them up or see them on, you know, your down imaging or even on your 2D. And generally, if you do see one or two on there, there's probably a whole lot more around. And, and that's just something that I've kind of learned over the years of when you see the right combination of bottom composition, the best thing to do is just, you know, spin around and actually fish it and okay. see if there's anything there. What do you have on your graphs when you when you are idling? Um, as far as you have your 2D, you have your down, your side, your map, and you get everything up. Is there one that you're particular really looking? It sounds like you're, you know, when you're trying to find those grass or boulders or transitions, you're really going to rely on your side image. But what does a typical screen setup look like for you? So I usually, I run two Humminbird Solix 12s and on the left-hand graph, I'll pretty much run full map. So I've got 12 inches of the Lake Master chart up. And then on the right-hand side, I run a split screen of side side imaging and down imaging Hmm. and I'll run it, you know, side imaging on top and down imaging down below. Cause then I can zoom in on the down imaging and still get, you know, that lower third that I want to see. Okay. But then still get the full frame of your side imaging, right? I don't like to run them side by side because then your side imaging gets crunched down and all those pixels kind of get smashed down together and you don't get the detail as if it you use that full screen. Wow. Yeah. Great point. So when you do locate some fish out deep, uh, you're set up at the bow of the boat. We know uh, you run 360 uh, quite a bit and rely on that a lot. Uh, how's your yeah. setup at the bow for these fish when you do find them deep? So um, I'm, I've, I mean, in the past I've ran two, more Humminbird Solix 12s. This year I'm actually going to three Humminbird Solix 12s and I'm going to run one will be uh, map and 2D side by side. And then that, you know, that way I've get kind of everything in front of that map. And then also I get the full column of 2D sonar. And then next to that, I'm going to run the Mega 360. And that will allow me to kind of position the boat and know how I need to approach something. And then the other thing with Mega360 is that it gives you the best amount of detail of understanding why those fish are actually there and how the bottom lays out. And I have made so much money. At at this point, it's already out there so i don't mind talking about it (laughs) but at first it was really hard for me to talk about because i made so much money you know fishing down an edge and all of a sudden seeing something out off to the side you know whether it's an isolated boulder or a high spot or you know it could be a number of things and i made so much money especially smallmouth fishing by doing that and you would never see it right because even with live imaging you're not scanning around the whole time like i'm trying to cover water i'm moving forward in the current or something and 360 allows you to really lay that out there and understand how those contours are laid out and what's there uh, but then the addition this year is i'm actually going to run mega live mm. on that third unit and uh, and so I'll have one unit dedicated to that mega live and one for the mega 360. And I'm just going to use those in conjunction with each other. The best of both worlds is to have both. Um, you right. know, I don't think you can say how, one how is excited Are you better, for that? I mean, to have that technology up front. That's, that's gotta be, uh, you gotta be excited to give that a try now. 360 and live. I'm I mean, pretty excited about it. Like, 
I mean, to me, it just, it just allows you to be that much more efficient, Mm. right? I don't, there's been a lot of conversations of like, Oh, do you think Pete, you know, the leagues are going to start banning sonar technologies and things like that. And I don't see that happening because the end of the day, it allows us to, you know, be more efficient and catch these fish. But it, at the end of the day, if you can't find them, it still doesn't matter. Like if you don't put yourself around those fish and find them, you can't just go drive around the lake and like automatically just see fish everywhere. These bodies of water are too big. You still have to have that knowledge and that understanding of the fish, how they move, how they react, uh, and, and being able to adjust with those fish, especially in a four day event there's the only constant in fishing is change. And so you have to be willing to adapt. And I think that's what I'm most excited about is the knowledge that can be gained from staring at that and understanding like how a fish under certain conditions reacts to certain baits and being able to actually see that happen because there, I know that there are just, there's way more fish that react to your bait than you ever see follow to the boat. Mm -hmm. And to be able to have that knowledge and see that actually happen in real time in conjunction with 360, where I can say, Oh, look, here's this nice little ditch that winds by and there's a grass patch over here and a grass patch over there. And I can scan across and say, Oh, they're sitting on the edge of that grass and then actually see my swim bait or whatever it is come sliding through the water column at just the right depth. Mm -hmm. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. The, the hard part is, is, and I've already been like prepping myself for this is knowing that that will be addicting and not getting caught up on fish that aren't willing to bite. Yes. You know, of like still understanding of when to stay and when to go. And I know that it's going to be that, you know, that's already super difficult in what we do. And it's only going to make it that much more difficult because you're actually going to see those fish sitting there. Like I can see them on my mega 360. It was, I could kind of see them on my old 360. It was more difficult, but with the mega 360, you get that detail separation. And uh, even this year at Lake Fork, like I could call my shot. I would, roll up to a spot. I could even spot lock and I would see the fish pull up out of the Creek channel and you'd see them swim up and set up on these flats. I'm like, all right, get ready, Kyle, the guy that films for me. And like, and then you'd catch them. Um, but to be able to actually like instantaneously scan around and not have to wait for it to come around would be pretty awesome. Yeah. I, you brought up a really good point. I think, you know, it's, it's, it's an amazing technology. It, it'll definitely help people become better, better, more efficient, better anglers, have a lot more fun on the water, but you don't want to get caught up in it. You don't want to be, uh, you know, so jacked up to use this and you forget your shallow butt you were just talking about. Right. And you don't even go up and see if there's anything hanging out in those shallow flats. Um, I can definitely see that happening when you're, when you're fishing deep and you're locating these fish and let's just say it's a typical summer, July, August, September pattern. You, I'm just going to lay the scenario down. You're, you're working a hump or some scattered rocks, off of a an edge defined on your lake master you're going down you you're, you're finally you know you might have been idling for sometimes hours right and then all of a sudden boom there they Days. are <laughs> Days, yeah. you set yeah. up on the fish what is your setup going to be as far as techniques for those deeper fish uh my go-to is a drop shot and it's pretty much like i'll have three or four rods rigged up ready to go with a drop shot I may have a quarter ounce on a couple of them, a three eighths on a couple more to change the rate of fall on those fish. And then I'm pretty much going to have like an X zone finesse slammer and maybe an original slammer. And that's going to be it. Like for me, I don't mess around with like trying a bunch of different things. I have so much confidence in those baits that for me, it's just about making the most presentations Okay. in the highest percentage areas. And so I'm just, I'm constantly just casting. Like if you see me fish, very rarely do you see me smallmouth fishing and casting out and just dragging it all the way back to the boat. Right. 
like, I'm going to cast, it's going to hit the bottom and I'm going to shake. I'm going to, I may move it, you know, 10, 15, 20 feet. And then I'm pretty much reeling it back in. I'm not yeah. very rarely do I drag it all the way back to the boat. Cause I feel like I can identify, I have the electronics to identify where that fish is sitting, right? I can look at my mega 360 and say, he is sitting somewhere right here. And if I make my cast within five feet of that, I should have an opportunity to get him to bite. And the more times I can make that cast, the better my odds are at, at getting one of those fish. Your, your drop shot set up. So we're running a, a few different size weights because of the rate of the fall. You're using the slammer. What's your routine when it comes uh, to your, your leader uh, length or your, I mean, your drop length? I would say 80% of the time I'm somewhere in that, like I'll just say 11 to 13 inches, you okay. know, give or take. Uh, when I tie it up, it's pretty much about the same. You know, one big thing is, is most of the people listening probably know this, but there may be some people that don't. You know, I find a lot of times as professionals, we forget about the little things and just assume everyone knows that it's common knowledge. But taking your tag in and dropping it back through the eye of your hook will make sure that that hook point only stands straight up. Just make sure you drop it through the side that has the hook, hook point on it. If you drop it through the other side, mm -hmm. it's going to do the opposite and your hook point will be facing down all the time. So sure. do that. If you didn't know that trick, it will, you will land so many more fish. Um, and then the other thing is pay attention to how you're fishing that, right? I say that, you know, 80% of the time I'm in that 11 to 13 inches, but that's because most of the time I'm casting and fishing the bait and not dragging it a long ways. Mm -hmm. Now, if you are in a situation where you're making really long casts and you're dragging or you're drifting that bait, what you have to think about is that if you're fishing straight below the boat and you've got 12 inches between your weight and your bait, you have 12 inches of clearance there. But if you go and you start dragging and you have 12 inches, well, now your line is at an angle and your bait may only be six inches off the bottom and those fish are up above that. And so that's something you have to think about is when that angle changes, right? It's still 12 inches, but now your line is at this angle and your bait's closer to the bottom. And so if you are in a position where you're dragging, drifting with current or, you know, you're making long casts and dragging, Sometimes you may have to add, you know, six, seven, eight inches to get that bait back up off the bottom. What is your setup on uh, spinning rail, reels and rods as far as drop shot in those depths? Are you a straight braid to floral? Or are you straight floral? What's your preferred method? I, I'm braid to floral. Uh, I've mm -hmm. been that way since I was, gosh, I don't know, like 12 years old when I first right. started doing it. Um, and I go uh, 15 pounds cigar smackdown to uh, it used to be a Tatsu cigar Tatsu leader, but they just came out with gold label last year. I got to start messing around with that stuff. And it's just as strong, if not stronger. And it's an even thinner diameter. Um, oh, wow. Like okay. Six pound test is six pound test is 0.185 millimeters diameter and it, so it's like it's super thin uh but incredibly strong uh, and and that's what i've been using is that seaguard gold label now and i'll go pretty much either six or eight pound test small mouth fishing you know i'll go up I'll to 10 that. pound test i'm large mouth fishing and you know the fish are pressured that six pound test will make a big difference now, I know you've experimented and, and you use a lot of uh, bigger swim baits, uh, it, glide baits and things like that. I wanted to make sure I ask you this question. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you've been messing around with for smallmouth and, and how's your success been? It does. It, you tend, they have to be in the right mood to get them to eat a glide bait really well. Okay. Because um, the, the problem with a glide bait is that they're already super curious creatures. And the glide bait, you know, it just has that, that nice, slow, kind of steady wandering action. If they're positioned around grass or like they're actively feeding, they will come up and they will smash it. 
Um, the problem is, is that when those fish are feeding, sometimes they're so aggressive that it's hard to hook up on them. Uh, what I've actually had the best success with uh, swim bait wise is something like the Storm Arashi swimmer, uh, like those multi jointed type baits that you can burn like a spinner bait and get the, those fish to react uh, because they think it's something getting away. They're opportunistic feeders and they're going to chase after it and smash it. And that seems to be the best big bait style that I've had. Okay. So you're burning that actually. Are you, um, yeah. are you using that to find fish as well? I mean, can you pitch to them with a, with a backup, whether it be a drop shot or a hair jig? I mean, I would think that would be a really yeah. efficient a lot of times, these shallow flats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of times I'll just, I'll turn the trolling motor on high and I'll burn water with that swimmer and you'll either have them come up and roll on it. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you catch them. And then a lot of times, you know, you'll see them at that last second come flying up at it because they see the shadow of their boat. They think that fish is going to get away and they come flying up and you're right there and you got a drop shot ready and you just drop it down, you know, reel it all the way up, drop it down, grab that drop shot and pitch out and just pay attention to where that fish is leading or, you know, swimming off to, and you just lead them and pitch out there. And a lot of times you can catch those fish. Sure. Wow. It, I, I got to It's something I want to do more of. I haven't experimented a whole lot. What yeah. size, uh, what size would you recommend as far as somebody getting started and, and throwing the glide bait for smallmouth? I mean, really anything in that six or seven inch size. Um, okay. I mean, you can go smaller, uh, but I don't know that there's really much reason to. You know, the biggest thing is just make sure that you don't have a bait that's too wide. Um, you know, you want one that's kind of a little bit more narrow. It's going to give them a better shot of getting it in their mouth. All right, Brandon, real good stuff. So I got to ask you this. What's your personal best smallmouth? I, my biggest one is one that I've actually weighed is seven and three quarters. Hey, uh, where'd that I, come from? Out of all place. Uh, that one came from a lake actually back here at home uh, called door shacks where I caught that one. But the, I, I caught one that may have been bigger uh, on Douglas Lake back before Douglas got a bunch of pressure. Uh, mm -hmm. I caught it in 2012. I didn't have a scale. Um, mm -hmm. Zaldane was actually there. He was on the water or he had gotten off the water and I called him. I got on this crazy offshore bite catching large mouth and small mouth mixed. And w like neither one of us had a scale, right? Typical sure. rookie move in 2012 and didn't. And, but I mean, still to this day, we both talk about it. Like how big was that fish actually? Cause it was just so long and big, but yeah, it was, uh, it had the potential. Like it was big enough to yeah. potentially be an eight pounder, but I know the, I, I have a legit weighed seven and three quarter, seven and three quarter. Walk me through that, that fish catch. What, what was the bait? How deep of water? How'd you react? Was uh, this a tournament fun fishing. <laughs> So no, this was actually, um, me and the guy that I was talking about earlier, Seth Burrell, that came up with the percentage triangle. We were actually okay. out fishing, uh, just trying to find some big ones. We had fished some of the places we typically fish and we didn't see a lot. And this is a place that you actually can graph them cause they'll get super deep, like 40, 50, 60, 70, 80 foot. And, uh, I came over this little hump and I saw just a couple marks. I think I saw two or three marks on this little rise and I spun back around and uh, three quarter ounce under spin with a swim bait on, on it. And I bomb it out there. First cast, I catch a two pounder. And I'm like, man, gosh, dang it. You know, like we didn't come down here to catch two pounders and I let it go fire back out there. And they're sitting in like 45 foot of water. So I'm letting it sink all the way down. I'm just slow reeling it back, slow reeling it back. And all of a sudden it just stops. Mm -hmm. I'm like, and this is a bunch of stumps in this lake. And I stop and I pick up and I just feel it get mushy. And I'm like, oh gosh. And I reel down and jacked it. And it, you know, rod loads up and I'll, you just see your line start doing this. <laughs> it's coming up, coming up. And you're like, oh gosh. And it, I mean, it couldn't jump seven and three quarter like it kind of comes up and just sure. wallers and goes back down and we're freaking out and uh yeah it was, it was pretty dang awesome
pretty cool. That's a seven three quarter, a potential eight on Douglas. We didn't even get into that. There's so much more I want to talk about, but we are getting short on time. I mean, another question I ask everybody: If you could use one bait, I'm not going to say for the rest of your life, but just for next year, okay? It's 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 fantasy. We're just we're just make believe here. But if you could have yeah. one smallmouth bait to throw, what would it be? Uh, it's an X zone finesse slammer, green pumpkin okay. blue, no doubt. Like yeah. that's confidence, deep, shallow. Uh, that's what I won Champlain on or with last year. I mean, I just I know that I'm gonna catch him if I get around him. And that bait excels for your fish that you're seeing that you can pitch to and fish out to 30, 40, 50 feet of water. You know, I think it's yeah. it's designed to resemble gobies, but you know what? That thing resembles pretty much anything that lives down there from perch to, to bait fish as well. Do you agree with that? Oh, 100%. I mean, you know, it was designed in that northeast part of the country to resemble gobies, but you change up the color profile and it can imitate any type of bait fish, right? Perch, minnows, gobies, you name it. It it can it works anywhere across the country. Yeah, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Well, what are your plans for this season? I mean, which uh obviously you're fishing the Bassmaster Elite series. Which ones are you looking the most forward to? Uh I, I'm actually excited to get to Pickwick. You know, we just got the classic swapped over uh -huh. to June. And Pickwick's going to be in March now. So I think that could really play for the smallmouth this time. And then obviously like Champlain and the St. Lawrence River, those are both going to be phenomenal events. Uh, different, but phenomenal. So someone that's had a lot of success and wins both on Champlain and the St. Lawrence River, does that affect, like, is there pressure on you to perform in those events like uh, have, it's it's what, it's only you know pressure I, mean? I put on myself i've had so much success there in the past that i put pressure on myself to say like you should catch them in this event sure yeah, like, I, yeah. and you know and that that also kind of doubles as confidence right i go into those events confident that i'm going to catch them and with that confidence there's also a little bit of pressure of like hey you should catch them. Don't screw this up, right? Like, sure. don't F this right. up. You yeah. should catch them. So how can people follow you on social media? I know you have um, a heck of uh, doing a really good job on videos, and everyone can really see how your your tournaments go throughout the season. Uh, what's the best way to follow you on social media, Brandon? Uh, pretty much everything is either Brandon Polinick, or if you don't want to try to figure out how to spell my last name because it's confusing – you can just type in bmpfishing.com and that'll take you to my website. And then there's links to all my social uh, links to YouTube video. There's some merch on there you can get like, so that's the easiest place to be able to find and then kind of branch out from there. Anyone that hasn't seen the YouTube videos, that's where I would suggest people mm -hmm. starting because you get a real behind the scenes in depth look at what those tournaments look like. Yes. You're doing an amazing job at that. I I've watched, uh, probably, probably every single one you've done. Thank you. And, uh, <laughs> you know what, you, Thanks. you can pick up a few things too. If you guys are interested in getting in the minds of, of Brandon and how he goes out there and catches these big smallmouth on a regular basis. It's, uh, it's pretty unreal, man. You, your track record speaks for itself. I'm so glad that you came on this podcast, I know the viewers and listeners are going to gain a lot of uh, knowledge from what you just dropped on us. So I certainly appreciate you uh, hanging out with us this evening. For sure. Yeah, thank awesome. you. I appreciate it. I look forward to the next one. And as always, until next time, we'll see you guys on the web. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.